नानम परमम धेयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम Okay, welcome back. So uh, we'll try to finish uh, this first module on dyna process dynamics, uh, where we try to understand how a process responds to changes in inputs uh, by uh, looking at uh, how can we predict the response of any transfer function given uh, there is some step in the input. So we will try to see, or I'll try to give you some tools uh, in terms of predicting the response of any transfer function, and this we will be doing uh, by finding out poles and zeros of that transfer function. So what we need is the transfer function. Uh, we once we have the transfer function, uh, we should be able to predict its uh, step response by using these steps. So the first step, uh, uh, let us say this is for a transfer function of the form ns over ds. So the first step is uh, to find all the poles and zeros and the next step is you use the final value theorem and in certain cases initial value theorem as well. And with the help of these two, uh, we would be able to predict a uh, response, a uh, step response of any transfer function. So for that, uh, what we do is, uh, we try to plot these poles and zeros uh, into the complex plane. So this is the real axis, uh, this is the imaginary axis. And in this figure, uh, for any transfer function, we'll plot or we'll put uh, the poles as well as zeros. So we'll start with poles. So let us say uh, the pole of the system falls at the origin. So this is our origin. Let us say if the pole is at the origin. So when the pole of a system or a transfer function is at origin, uh, the denominator of the transfer function will have a term 1 over s or the denominator will have a term s. So when we have a step response, uh, it will be get multiplied by 1 over s. So we will have terms like s square when we look at the transfer uh, Laplace of y s. So in such a case, when you have pole at origin, the transfer function will have s in the denominator. So when we talk about y s, it will have s square multiplied by something. So when we want to take y s in terms of partial fractions, in that case uh, we will be writing it as a over s plus b over s square and the other terms. So what we are going to have is b over s square, the inverse of that will give you b t. So even though uh, so this system will have will increase linearly with time or the one of the dynamic modes of this system will increase linearly with time. So whenever you have pole at origin, it will be an unstable system. or grows linearly with time. So it will not have a stable final value. So that is the case when you have pole at the origin. When we have pole on the real axis, any pole on this real axis in the left half plane. So with a negative value, what we are going to have is the response will have e raised to minus some lambda t terms which all will decay down to 0. So all these will give you stable response to stable or finite response. 
over damped response there will be no oscillations in such a case the oscillations will come if the poles or the there are complex conjugate poles so if you have any pole in this quadrant or this quadrant again still in lower left half plane what you will get are decaying oscillations these terms will give you e raised to power a plus b i so there will be e raised to a t and e raised to b i t so that first term will give you the magnitude of oscillation and the second term will give you sines and cosines so as the magnitude is on the negative side uh, the uh, the oscillations will decay but there will be oscillations when you have the poles on the left half plane but not on the axis or the real axis exactly opposite case uh, would be when we talk about the right half plane so this is the case when all the poles are on the left half plane now if any pole is on the right half plane if it is on the axis it will be e raised to power some positive number times t so the response will just grow in time so the response will be infinite when time goes to infinity so all these would give you unstable or infinite response this happens when any of the pole is on this side even though n minus 1 poles are on the left half plane even a single pole on the right half plane will give you these kind of responses because all these will die down to zero as time t goes to infinity so the only thing which does not die down to zero will be anything on the right half plane similarly if we have some complex conjugate poles these will give you oscillations but these will be growing oscillations so the oscillation magnitude will keep on growing as a function of time and again it you will get infinite response as time t goes to infinity so if any pole or any pair of poles is on the right half plane you will have such infinite or <coughs> growing responses uh, the last case which is remaining in this is if your poles are complex conjugate but or with real part which is zero or purely imaginary poles so in that case uh, what you will get are sustained oscillations which is also known as marginally stable process so depending on where your poles of the process lie uh, you may have an overdamped response stable and finite you may have decaying oscillations you may have growing oscillations you may have an unstable or infinite response or you may have sustained oscillations into your system and lastly you may have an integrator which increases linearly as a function of time so depending on uh, the values of poles for a system the overall dynamic modes of the process can be calculated by simply looking at uh, the poles then next comes are the zeros so if i want to summarize this what you would get is so pole at origin gives you integrator pole real and negative will give you overdamped response complex with negative real part will give you decaying oscillation and then the opposite uh, side of that uh, would be real and positive so infinite response complex with positive real part will give you growing oscillation and then purely imaginary pole 
will give you sustained oscillation. So, so far we have uh, not looked at uh, where the zeros of the system are. So, we will now see uh, how this analysis changes uh, when we have zeros into the system as well. So, when uh, you have 0 into the system or 0 at origin, Uh, the transfer function will be of the form s in the numerator. So, whenever you try to find out the final value, by the final value theorem, it will be limit s tending to 0 s of y s is equal to limit s tending to 0 s times step response, so it will be limit s tending to 0 a times g of s and as 0 is at origin g of 0 is 0. So, the final value of the response will be 0. So, whenever there is a 0 at origin the response decays to 0. So, the final value of the output will always be equal to 0 whenever there is a 0 at the origin. So, uh, if we go back to this figure, so if I say there is a 0 at origin, then it will give me response goes to 0. Now, for most of the parts uh, 0 would just change the relative contribution uh, which would not be uh, directly predictable. Uh, the only case when you can predict uh, the response of a 0, so let us try to use a different figure for 0. So, this is real part, this is imaginary part. So, if there was a 0 at the origin, the response decays to 0. Now, if the 0 is on the real negative real axis and it is closer than any of the poles. So, this 0 is on the real negative real axis and it is closer than any of the poles to the origin. In that case, you will get overshoot without oscillations obviously. So, this was the case uh, when we had overshoot into that first order or second order system. This is the type of 0 which is the to origin than any of the poles. Those cases will give you overshoot. And the other case uh, which is going to give you interesting results is if the 0 is on the right half plane. So, if the 0 is a real 0 on a right half plane, it is going to give you inverse response. So, by uh, putting the 0 also into the, uh, into the complex plane, uh, you can predict whether there will be an overshoot without oscillation or whether there will be an inverse response. This will be on top of the way we predicted the response for the poles and the combined response will be the combination of these two factors. And then lastly, uh, something which you should also keep in mind while predicting the response is the initial slope of response. So, that is dy by dt at t equal to 0. So, that depends on the difference, write it the other way around, degree of the denominator polynomial minus the degree of the numerator polynomial. 
of this difference is greater than 1 then the initial slope will be equal to 0. That was the case uh, when we had a pure second order or a pure higher order system. In that case the denominator polynomial degree was greater than the numerator by 1 uh, more than 1. So, in that case the response does not start immediately the response has a 0 slope at time t equal to 0. When the difference is equal to 1 then the slope is finite the slope is not equal to 0 the response immediately starts and if this difference is equal to 0 in that case dy by dt is not defined and there is a discontinuity in y. So, this was the case uh, when we have the lead lag type of dynamics. This was the case of the first order dynamics and this is the case when you have second or higher order dynamics. So, by knowing the initial slope or how the response starts uh, then looking at whether you have overshoot or inverse response and then also combining it with whether you have stable response, overdamped response, growing uh, decaying oscillations, growing oscillations all that in combination you would be able to predict response of any transfer function for a step change. So, to summarize uh, what we have seen is uh, the poles of the system or transfer function will give you what are the dominant modes of that particular dynamic uh, transfer function. The zeros will give you the relative contribution and will also give you some conditions when you can get overshoot or inverse response. And then these values of poles and zeros would be able will help you to predict response of any dynamical system. So, at this point uh, we have finished uh, and analyzing how dynamical systems behave. So, uh, in terms of in the context of this course on process control what we have seen is given a change in the input how the system responds. So, now we have a better understanding of the process once we now we are now at a position that uh, we know how the system is going to behave. So, now we can have a way to control the process. Now, we are at the stage where we, we know how the system behaves. So, we know exactly how uh, in order to move the process from one point to the other how we should change the input of the process. So, it is more like an in solving an inverse problem. So, as we know the way process behaves uh, we should be able to now tame its behavior or move the or behave make the process behave the way we want. So, that will be the part uh, we will be discussing under the second module of this course which will be on process control. So, thank you.